Praise the Lord. We're running late. What is the time saying? you, but I'm ready to have some church. Now, we believe that things ought to be decent in order because the Bible says, let all things be done decently and in order, but sometimes when something breaks or explodes or catches fire and it's just a mad scrambling to get everything back on track, it can be quite invigorating at times, can't it? Amen? Am I the only one awake this morning? All right, well, let's stand and go before the Lord in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you today. We come here with an intention in our heart, Father, to connect with you, to seek your face, and to worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, we need you. We know we're not self-sufficient, maybe in other ways, but not when it comes to life. We need you to live. We need you for life in us. We need you for righteousness, for salvation, for a new start in life, Father. We need you for everything. We seek you today to meet our needs, Father, to receive our thanks and our praise, our worship from the deepest part of our hearts. Father, let your will be done in this house, in this service today. Let it be done in every one of us, in our lives, in our minds and hearts. We thank you and we praise you for it today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Grab a hymnal. Turn to page. 65. Let's start with a couple of songs, shall we? How about at Calvary? That's where it all begins. It's where it always begins. Jesus' sacrifice for us on the cross on Calvary that we may be born again. Amen. Let's sing about it. 465.
place in Scripture. It's a unique name, the lily of the valley, something so clean, so pure, so innocent, so utterly without blame, so simple, uncomplicated, not hard to understand at all. Jesus represents and creates within us a beauty that the world can't match. Amen? What's that? The beauty of innocence. There's no cosmetic company out there that can sell you that. They can sell you a look. They can sell you a lifestyle. But they cannot sell you innocence. Only Jesus can work that in us again. Amen? Amen. All right, let's make sure that the gospel didn't change on me and I, you got a memo that I didn't get. I'm, I mean it. Innocence, so you don't know what I've done in my past. I don't care what you did in your past. What Jesus can do in your present is all that matters today. Amen. Let's sing about it. 479, Lily of the Valley. that have been traveling and have made it back safely, alive and in one piece to Cheyenne, welcome back. Welcome back. We kept you in our prayers. We're glad that uh, no tragedies befell you. Hopefully no tragedies befell you, but either way, God is able uh, to fix even such things as that. So you make him sound like some kind of Superman. Oh, he's way more than that. He does far more, can do and does and accomplishes things that not even that silly little comic book character could accomplish. Amen? 
The, the, lot, the world has a lot of problems, but they all stem from one unsolvable problem, unsolvable where the world is concerned. But Jesus comes in on the scene and it changes everything. What do you mean by that? Well, just to skip ahead a little bit, not that we're preaching out of the Revelation today, but it's something he says right near the end of the book. And a lot of people love to quote it. Sometimes we forget it. He says, I stand at the door and knock. That is Jesus right there. Of course, he's not at the front door. That'd be booming and we'd all hear it. He's talking about at the door of everyone's heart that needs to believe on him, that needs his saving, his transformative work in our lives. Jesus is still calling to people. Jesus is still standing at the door of people's hearts, knocking, seeking entrance, seeking, seeking us to willingly let him in, people to willingly let him in, so that he can save them, amen, and change them and give them an entirely new life in him. We'll talk a little bit about that out of a whole other book of the Bible here by and by. But welcome to our church. If this is your first time here, don't be a stranger. Amen. Don't be. We're here for a reason. This isn't a social club. This isn't something that just, this is not just a Sunday morning thing that we come to hang out for a while, shake hands, speak religious words to one another, and then all go back out and live the same old wretched lives. Jesus saved us, amen? And he's changed us. We're different now. We're new now. The old man is dead. The new man is alive in Jesus Christ. And so come be a part of this fellowship. Well, no, I don't want to, open, I don't want to go down too many rabbit trails, but welcome, Welcome. We do things a little old-fashioned here. It doesn't mean we're against new innovations. It just means that we value what we have that's good, no matter how old-fashioned it is. So at this time, though, let's go ahead and receive the Sunday morning offering and tithe. If our ushers would come, Brother Roy, Brother Valencia. We know that all Christians tithe and give in offerings. That's how the ministry is supported. Now, don't worry. We don't send a bill collector your way. We trust that you got enough God that you do the right thing. And God blesses and loves a cheerful Amen. giver. Amen. So what if I don't have any cash on me or a check or something like that? On those little envelopes back there at the guest book stand, they have a little QR code on them. You just take one of your fancy smartphone thingies that everybody seems to worship nowadays, just joking, and just scan that thing. It'll take you right to our website. We have online giving. If you'd rather do that, you can entirely up to you. Brother, would you please pray? Amen. Amen. Looked out her kitchen window at the city she knew and loved. And though it was doomed to destruction, she couldn't bear the thought of giving it up. This is my last night. In Sodom, the place of my wealth, my comfort, my gain. I'm not ready to leave. On the road to deliverance, she turned and looked back. 
signed to the Lord of the faith that she lacked. The fire of his judgment could not be held back. It was her last night. She looked out her kitchen window, remembering the tears of those she'd lost and though tomorrow seemed uncertain she was accepting the thought of giving them up this is my last night in Moab the land of my youth my love and my of the promise she vowed committing herself to the true God she found blessing and honor in heaven lay down it was her last night I look out my kitchen at the sun as it comes up wondering if this is the last day before we'll be caught up oh, 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 oh. is this my last night in Sodom you said the earth will go up in flames and is this my last night in Moab you promised a new city and a new name I am ready to leave one of them looked down a hill to a grave the other looked up in Lord, help me always to trust and obey. This could be my last night. This could be my last night. Hallelujah. Let's lift our hands once more and worship together. Father, we thank you for the time that you have given us, this life you have given us, especially this life in you, your grace, your mercy, Father, all of it. Help us to live now every day like it's our last and do all we can for you and for your kingdom while it is still day. Father, we bless you and we thank you for all your goodness to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. 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 I want to read to you from the prophet Yoel this morning. Did not mark my place, so it's a race. Let's see who gets there first. Yoel, Yoel, Yoel. I'm nowhere near it. What happens when you have tech problems? It uh, puts you in a rush. And what's that? You got it? All right, you win. I don't know what you win, but you win something. Thing is, I need to read a fairly substantial portion of that. Come on, minor prophets, minor prophets. Book of Yoel. There we are. Chapter 2, and I want to begin in verse 21. Yoel, chapter 2, verse 21. 
Fear not, O land. This is a prophecy going forth by the mouth of the prophet Yoel. Fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first months. So why is that a big deal? Well, when you live in an agrarian society where everyone's life ultimately depends on the earth putting some food out there for us, amen? So I'm a cattle rancher, I don't have to worry about that. Yeah, your cows got to eat something, right? So it all kind of works together. We're not in competition, it's cooperation. He says, be glad, ye children of Zion. He talks about the rain, the former and the latter rain, in the first month. And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be ashamed. Let me read one more verse. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. And focusing on part of verse 25 this morning, I want to take and use that for our text. And I will restore the years to you. I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten. Let us pray. I want to ask brother... Brother Bill, sir, would you please pray for the message this morning, the messenger, all of us that are here. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten. We're revisiting this scripture right now out of one of the more obscure prophets. I suppose Yoel he shared some very powerful messages. He shared some very powerful prophecy with us that would be fulfilled over 700 years later on the day of Pentecost. But that wasn't his only prophecy. Here he's speaking another prophecy that went forth about in the 7th century B.C. And while it was directed originally at the Jews, or as he describes them here, the children of Zion, that's who the Jews were, and while it was directed at them and it was a very specific prophecy, a prophecy of restoration and all of that, and it, it seems to be, and it is at face value, a prophecy that speaks very much to the natural, the condition of the land, the condition of the country, their prosperity, food enough to eat, and more than that. And again, you go back to, we sort of lost track of it, an industrialized and information age society that we live in where we measure wealth by money and banks and possessions owned and do you have the newest computer or the snazziest glass god that people carry around in their pockets with them and all that other junk. We measure wealth and success by so many things nowadays, so many diverse things if you will, but back then and in ancient societies and in many other places in the world not so developed, they measured wealth in their livestock. They measured wealth in their, uh, their food stores and their provisions, their grain and all of that. So it's not something to turn our noses up at or to look down at them uh, with, an, uh, with an attitude of, well, they're pretty primitive people that they had to be so concerned about that. If you want a steak, why don't you just go to the store where they make steak? That, that's a joke. 
But there are people that think that way. They think that meat just gets made at the grocery store. Like, no, that comes from cows, right? We know that, don't we? Well, I'm just making sure. You can never, you can never tell sometimes. <sighs> anyway, boy, I lost myself on all that. It was a prophecy that spoke of that. It spoke of peace and of plenty. And it spoke, of, resur- it spoke of, of restoration. And it spoke of something that had come that had devoured so much of their substance that had just chewed it down to the ground that had brought them as a people low. And it happened for a reason and all of that. But the lesson here, we find a clear message in this. Even though this was a prophecy about 2,700 years old now, at this point, and even though it was to a specific people in a specific land about something very specific that we might not think applies to us, there is a message that a clear message in this for the New Testament believer within its poetic words. God will make up for lost time in our lives if we will but trust in Him and walk in obedience to His will. Amen. He will do that. God is a restoring God. He really is. And He's not just about saving souls. Not that that warrants even... the. Why are my keys up there? It warrants the word just. You know, like that's all that it is. Like it's some low thing not to be valued or some minor thing cheaply acquired on a discount rack at Walmart. God saves souls, but He does more than save souls. He also takes broken lives that have been wasted and wrecked by the locust and the canker worm and all these things of sin and of bad decisions or even of tragedy itself. He takes broken lives and saves them. He really does. I've seen him save marriages. I've seen him save families. Marriages that were on the rocks, one step from divorce. Maybe papers even already filed. And and families falling apart and other situations that were just in absolute ruins. God can come in if a man will just let them in. Let him in and he will work a miracle in a life. I mean a real one. Not some charlatan Benny Hinn junk knock you down and say that that is something. You know, I've been reading this for 30 years, over 30 years, and I've never found any scriptural precedence for, well, anyway, let's leave that alone. Careful, Pastor, you're going you're gonna to tip over my sacred cow. <laughs> Stick around. We tip lots of those. Because we just want the pure simplicity of the godly life. Amen? Amen? We want the gospel. We don't want a circus act. Do you see any light shows? I know we got these fluorescents and all that, but you see any light shows going on in here? No light shows? Smoke machines? We're fresh out. All right. I'll stop. I'll be good now. God will make up for lost time. Here he speaks of devouring pests in our Bible reading. And again, to city folk a lot of times, that doesn't, that doesn't really hit real hard. I mean, we kind of understand what he's saying about locusts and canker worms and stuff like that. We understand on an intellectual level, oh yeah, it's a bad thing. They can kind of mess some things up, right? But, you know, unless you've ever actually experienced the loss of an entire crop from a, a swarm of locusts that have come in and devoured that thing to the ground and left nothing but stubble, then it doesn't really hit you right in the fields or in the heart or in the personal experience. Now maybe if you've gardened, you've had something like that happen and you can appreciate it a bit more. He speaks of the locust, the canker worm, the caterpillar, and the palmer worm. I had to look some of these up a while back to, to see what the difference was between like, well, what's a canker worm? I know what a caterpillar is. We used to squish them when I was little. But what's a palmer worm? And so you look it up and it gives you an idea what they do. These are pests that come in by swarm or creep in under the radar, under the leaves of your carefully tended garden or of your carefully tended crops. If you're a farming man or a ranching man and you raise food for your own cattle or whatever, they come in subtle sometimes and sometimes not so subtle and they devour whole crops and afflict young plants and they basically wreak havoc on the farm or in the garden. 
They destroy, they devour, and they give nothing back. They take and return absolutely nothing. They take your labor and wipe it off the face of the earth and leave you and I hungry, starving, barren, destitute, and in a serious crisis. Their destructive potential, especially that of the locust, is legendary. And it can literally destroy an entire year's worth of a family's hard labor and increase. Sometimes it happens slowly over time, and sometimes it happens in a flash. Have you ever seen a swarm of locusts at work? Sometimes, I don't know, maybe do a video search for them. But every account that I've ever read about it or heard about it from someone who has seen it, and it does happen. So aren't locusts just like grasshoppers? What's the big deal? They just jump around. They're harmless. No, they're not. They're not. They may not eat you, but they will eat your food, and they will leave you with nothing. Why are you bringing this up? We'll, we'll, we'll get there. We'll, we'll get there. I'm watching the clock. I'm being mindful. I'm trying not to tell the same joke 50 times, just 48, okay? They destroy. There are people that do the same thing, just as a quick aside. There are people that do the same thing as the caterpillar and the palmer worm and the locust. They, they come into your life and, and they seem like they're harmless, but they devour your time. They devour your resources. They devour your joy. They just call, they do that to a whole society. And there's a certain group, a particular demographic that likes to migrate en masse into countries that are not of their culture. And then they get entrenched in there. They set up enclaves and they begin to pull off of that country's resources, their welfare state and all of that. And they hang and drag on that entire society until they can make that society as corrupt and polluted as the one that they fled, just like locusts do. So this goes a number of different ways. Not that that's, the, that's not the heart of the message today, not by any means, but it's something to consider. So are the afflictions of life sometimes. So are the sins that the born-again believer used to live in before they were born again. With the sins that we once lived in, the bad decisions that we may sometimes make, which carries a price to be paid. And Paul even talks about that. So well, I'm, a, I'm a Christian. I never sin anymore. You better not. But uh, we know that that's probably not too likely that you can say I've never sinned one time since the hour I first believed. Don't worry, I'm not trying to give anybody an excuse or throw a wet blanket on the service. This is a message about hope and about restoration uh, on a level that a lot of people give up on long before they ever give God a chance to really work in their lives. Paul, the apostle, speaks of the quote-unquote, the sins that so easily beset us. If we give in to them, if we invite the problem, we give in to them, we invite the problems and the consequences that come with them into our lives to devour our spiritual increase and sometimes even our physical increase. And one of the very first things that almost always comes to mind when I think about this, bad decisions that carry consequences. We see it exercised in, in society at large all over the place, especially, well, I don't want to get into the demographics of it all, what kinds of cities and all of that, but it's, it's become very, very common. You say, well, I just want to sleep around. I don't want to be responsible. I just want to get, just want to jump in the sack with somebody. I just want to live in fornication, preacher. Okay, fine, but someone's going to deal with the consequences for 18 years. Now, again, that's not the heart of this, but someone's got to talk about this. That somebody's really, we can't be afraid to just pull that out and la label that for what it is. Well, that's okay, I'll just get an abortion. Really? Really? Just march on down to the clinic and sacrifice your child to a murderer in a lab coat. Yeah, we still take a hard line stance on that too. No, I don't go pick it outside of abortion clinics. I typically find that's a waste of time. If people get saved, they won't get an abortion. Amen? I'd rather go around with the gospel of Jesus Christ and say, hey, there's hope. There's, there's forgiveness. There's a new chance. There's a second chance. There's a fifth chance. There's however, whatever. There, there, there's, a, there's, there's hope for your present day and for your future. There's a new start that you can have. <coughs> 
excuse me, I don't know where this drainage is coming from. Maybe from this psycho weather we've been having. <coughs> excuse me. What have we had, like six winters this year? <coughs> I was out in it on Friday. We had uh, plumbing here, guys from Bull Ridge, <coughs> trying to uh, <coughs> fix a backup that we had in the main line on the way out of here. I know you didn't come to hear about the church's building problems, but this one's solved. Hallelujah. <coughs> but it took two crews and it took two days. We had to have the well pumped out, and had to find the obstruction. They camered everything, scoped everything. It was a big mess. It was nasty. <clears throat> Brother Mariani, remind me to talk to you about uh, the shims under that lid. I forgot to put them back. <clears throat> Not worried about it then. It's all good. So, <clears throat> <clears throat> bear with me a moment, please. I apologize. Everything cleared out. Can I talk now? Okay, thank you. The Apostle Paul speaks of these things. And that's just one of the low-hanging fruits, one of the many examples. And it's not something that believers do. And it's not something that anybody should do. So I'm not a believer. Well, you need to be. And either way, sin is sin. And it doesn't matter if it has a clinical mask on it or not. We need to do things right. Someone's going to pay a price for the wrong things that we do. Most of the time, it's us. Sometimes it's someone who shouldn't have to pay the price for the wrong thing that we do. But God offers hope even in the midst of all of us. In the midst of all of it. If we give in to these things, we invite the problems and the consequences. And those things will come in like locusts. They will come in like canker worms. And they will devour our lives from the inside out and leave us empty and bereft and hollow and bitter. That's what they'll do. That's what these problems will do. If we invite them in, they will cause these problems. Look at the life. Look at the life of the sinner and of the unbeliever. And you know me. You know that I don't say that with a high mind. I don't say that with pride. I don't say that with a superiority complex. We were all born sinners. And we had to be saved. We needed Jesus Christ in our lives or we'd still be just as lost as we ever were. But when you look at the life of the unbeliever, of the one that remains in sin, especially with those without good judgment or those without any self-restraint, their troubles beset them on every single side eventually, don't they? Talk to some of these folks. I invite you, and I'm very careful how I say this. I'm very careful how I say this. Homeless people are real people, and, and they're, they're just as much human beings as you and me. But go walk up to a homeless person sometime. Strike up a conversation with one of them, if they'll have a conversation with you. And ask them questions. Don't judge them. Don't accuse them. But just have a conversation with them and ask them uh, if, if it's safe to, uh, or if they're willing to answer. Ask them how they came to that state in their life. Was it just misfortune? Was it just a bad roll of the dice, so to speak? Or was it the cumulative effects of a lifetime or of several years of wrong decisions that just made things worse and worse and worse and worse in their lives? And it just invites it all in, doesn't it? Now, the same thing works the other way, but, but this is something to consider, especially if you're, on, if you're on the threshold this morning. I don't know if anybody here is, but God knows, and I think I'm already getting a witness but if you're, if you're on the threshold of making one of those, uh, those jumping-off-the-cliff types of decisions about your life and just hoping that something's going to be there to catch you, something like, well, I'll just walk out on my family. I'll just abandon my marriage. I'll just quit my job, and I'll just, you know what? I'm just going to start walking uh, in, some, in some direction of the compass, and I'm not going to stop until I feel like I've got a good reason to. You need to be careful what you decide to do. Because those decisions stack. And you make enough of the wrong ones. So well, I'll just hit rock bottom and then I'll look up to God. Uh, no, no. There is no rock bottom. That's a bottomless pit. Bad decisions are a bottomless pit. As, as one person said, brother, you know this. There's always, not because he's done it, but he knows the same source of this as me. There's always something stupid that a person can do. 
that'll make things even worse than they already are. It's true. But then, the, but then the opposite is true also. You say, well, my life is very bad right now. I've got, I got problems that you don't know about. Some of them are medical. Most of them are money. Some of them are relational. Some of them are, uh, you know, things aren't even right between me and God right now, a person might say. And I just don't see anything going good at all right now. Okay, well then, why not start making good decisions right now and, and it might not seem like it has a huge effect on your life but it'll start getting things going in the right direction and the first right decision that any one of us can make is to do what God wants us to do in any particular situation you're a sinner this is your chance to get saved this morning amen and that is the best decision of an entire life the best the best decision of an entire life Give in to God. Wave the white flag. Stop pushing back against Him. Stop resisting Him. Stop holding Him out at arm's length and making excuses for it all. Just give in to Him. Their trouble besets them like locusts and caterpillars. The lost and wasted wages, the broken homes and broken families, the damaged health, sometimes ruined health, the criminal record that follows them maybe even all the way to the grave. And sometimes afflictions come on upon the life of a Christian as well. In fact, uh, it can even be frequently. Nobody gets through this life trouble free. Nobody gets through this life without any problems or without any kind of hardships. And so even upon us that are born again, we who are new creatures in Christ, there are problems and afflictions that come upon our lives as well. And we try to manage them, I guess, as best we can. But regardless, we do not need to despair or to lose hope over it. I want to be careful about this. Because I know some people here have had a brutal last two years. I know. God's not unmindful of it, and I'm not unmindful of it. And my wife and I, my wife and I's last two years hasn't exactly been cupcakes and rainbows. Hasn't been. I'm not singing the blues. I don't have my violin up here. play a violin to save my life. I make tortured cat sounds with it. That's about it. We have hard times sometimes. I know. And God knows. But He doesn't just talk about these devouring pests. He gives us a promise. God can do for you and I. God can do for anyone. What he, what he promised the land of Israel at the mouth, by the mouth of Joel here, or Joel. He gives us a promise. He said, I will restore to you the years. Oh, and that's curious language there. Notice he doesn't say, I'll restore to you the crops or the gardens, or the things that were destroyed in that prairie fire. I'll restore to you uh, the wages that were lost when your identity was stolen, or when your bank account was hacked, and they took all your money, and the FDIC, whatever, and they decided not to actually help you out, or even if they're worth anything. I don't even know if they're worth anything or not. I've never had to test that. He didn't say he would restore the things that were lost. He said, I will, do, I will restore to you the years. Now, there's meaning in that. That is not something to just blow past and say, well, that just sounds nice and poetic. Like you said, poetic verses, but they're not mere poetry. They weren't even written as poetry. They were written as prophecy. There are things that we can lose in this life that we really just cannot get back. And that's something not, not to be uh, resented. That's not something to be bitter about. It's not something to spend your life mourning about that loved one that passed away. Why live in mourning for the rest of your life for that? I'm not trying to kick people's shins. I'm really not trying to kick people's shins. I'm trying to open people's eyes to, all right, your son died. That's a tragedy. That's worse than a parent dying. Okay, that's worse than that. I can't imagine if my daughter met a premature death. I'm supposed to kick the bucket before she kicks the bucket. And really, the trumpet's just supposed to sound and so we can all get out of here together. Amen? Amen. 
That's really what we want to happen, but we don't really have any control over that. And so, so, so your son died, or that spouse died, or, or left, or, 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 or there, was, so there was a genuine tragedy there in your life. But, and I'm not talking to anybody in particular today. I'm saying that we cannot live our lives constantly mourning for lost loved ones. The crops devoured or reaped. You can't change that. But God didn't leave you on the earth to spend your years mourning. That doesn't mean that you just have to get over it right now. And you'll always miss them. I know. I know. I had to start thinking about my mom. Just yesterday, I was working on something, it came back to mind, and, and it just, I get it, man, it hits you. And when it does, it just shuts you down. You can't do anything but just sit there and tr just breathe, you know, and, and let it pass. And, and maybe just fall apart for a while, and then God helps put you back together. It's one of the reasons why the comforter is there, amen. Okay? But to live our lives... Never doing anything, never getting on with life, never getting back to serving the Lord our God, never getting back to joy and to peace and all of that. And if the one that passed away in your life was a believer, rejoice for them. It's not easy, I know, I know, it's not easy, but lay your head down at night knowing in just a few years I'm going to see him again. In just a few years, I'm going to see them again. A loved one, a family member, a beloved pastor. I'm thinking of Sister Olson, my pastor's wife. Passed away um, not quite two years ago, about a year and a half ago now. Uh, passed away. And so take heart. Some things we lose that we can't necessarily get back. That destroyed, that destroyed crop, that child that died, the career that we destroyed by our own bad decisions, missed opportunities, and so on. We cannot restore them, but God can replace them. A new crop, maybe a new child, a new, go a, a new job, new chances, whatever it might be. New mercies from God. He says in Jeremiah, His mercies are new every single morning. Don't you know there's new things? I mean, that's a good title for, for, for today. I didn't share the title, Making Up for Lost Time. I didn't even say what our title was today. Making Up for Lost Time, but maybe this is a better one. New mercies. New things from God. New things restoring other things that were lost or destroyed, whatever the cause may be. The scope of restoration that God is talking about here in saying, I will restore the years. I will restore the years to you that the locust has devoured, that the canker worm has devoured. The scope of that, of that restoration is much broader than mere replacement. This is what I want to open our eyes to or let God open our eyes to uh, today. That God promises more than just, oh, you lost a car, God will give you another car. Oh, you lost some money, well, you shouldn't have been gambling in a way anyway. Throw your scratch tickets away. Don't you know how reckless and irresponsible that is? Is that okay? Can I kick that cow too? You can people gamble. Like that money cost you labor in your life, didn't it? You worked for that. And you're going to go throw it down on... Well, maybe I'll win a million bucks. Give me, give me another five. Give me another five of those. Spend $25 on stupid scratch tickets and get $5 back, maybe. Sorry, I wasn't planning on mentioning that, but that's just something... I'll leave that alone, you know? Take your money and do something smart with it. Or at least buy something with it, right? Something useful. Groceries. $5 a gallon gasoline. Oh, sorry, I'm not trying to depress us today. I don't want to think about that right now. I will restore the years. He's not saying that he'll give you back the lost time. That would be nice. Especially when you're past a certain age. We'll just... 
Leave that there and pretend that I'm not that age. You know, it, 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 it would be nice. Yes, it'd be nice that if the age of 49 that we heard the voice of God say, you know what, I'm going to wind your biological clock back to about 22. How would you like that? And let's give you uh, that whole stretch of time all over again. Woo! That'd be sweet, wouldn't it? Get all that energy back and keep the wisdom that you've gained through decades of hard knocks and all that. That'd be beautiful, but he does not promise that. He doesn't say he'll give us back the time that in that way, but he can make up for time that we have lost. Making up for time that we lost to years of sin and foolishness and bad choices. And he can even make up for time that we've lost to tragedies and to hardships. He can do that. And my mind always goes back to that lady. I've talked to her. I've talked about her before. She was old when she got saved. She's an old woman. Well advanced in years. Living down in the old soldier's home, home in, uh, in Ording, Washington, just down, the, just down the hill from the Bible college where I was at. And uh, somebody had met her and someone had invited her to church and she started coming to church. An old woman had that, had that, uh, had that condition, uh, that condition where, where you shake all the time like Catherine Hepburn used to do. Uh, she was like that. She's shaky, real shaky, but, but she fell in love with Almighty God. And she heard the gospel, and, and even in her advanced years, she didn't have a bitter attitude toward it. She didn't have a, a spirit of, oh, well, I've wasted my life, and there's just no hope for me. That's not the case. No matter how old you are, you trust God today, God can restore the years no, he won't wind back your biological clock. He won't give you back your youth. But he will make up for lost time. From the day that woman got saved until the day of her death, her life was filled with faith and with, the, with richness in God. I don't mean money. You know I don't mean money. You know, you know I don't mean anything like that. But her life had taken on the purpose that it had always been intended to have. And it had a meaning that it had never had before that. I watched her get baptized. We had a, bapti a baptismal service uh, one Sunday afternoon. And, and, uh, and they... <laughs> They helped that shaky old sister uh, 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 down into the baptistry and, and down into the water she went, man. And, and then and she came up out of it and her face, uh, it wasn't literally glowing, but it sure looked like it could have been. And it was a smile and a peace and, and an absolute divine contentment on her face as she came up out of that water, head shaking, hand shaking, arms shaking, the brethren helping her out of that pool and telling you, God can restore things. He can take a broken life Every piece of it. Start putting it back together again. All right. First thing you need to fix is your soul. Let's get the sin out of there. All right. How do I do that? Repent, believe, confess, be born again. You'll confess to me. I'm nothing for receiving that, all right? You confess to Almighty God. He's the judge. He's the king. He's the God over all gods. Amen. Repent. Get the sinner life behind you. That's a decision, a surrender, and a prayer. That's what that is. And that's the very first thing that he fixes. Because unless that's fixed, then nothing else really matters in the eternal sense. Right? Jesus said, what, what, is it, what difference does it make? If, what does it profit a man if, if he gains the entire world and loses his own soul? You got millions? Bully for you. <laughs> Sorry, a little bit of British slang there. Don't ask me why that popped in there. <laughs> and it's worthless when you die. It's going to go to somebody else, right? There you go. Fix the sin problem first, if there's a sin problem there. You say, well, but I believe in Jesus. Okay. But are you living in sin? I'm going to make a distinction between these things here. So I believe. I, I know who Jesus is. Oh, well, great. So do the devils, Right? You got to get the sin problem fixed. And then once that's fixed, God will start reaching his hand into every aspect of your life and straightening out crooked things and mending things that are broken 
and putting them back together. All right, here's a, a families on the rocks. Let's see if we can't. Let's see if we can't maybe fix this. Let's get the man saved. Let's get the mom saved. Let's get somebody in that family saved and then shining the light of the gospel and of a second chance and a new life in Jesus Christ. Shining that light in the, in the, in the whole rest of the family. And then maybe somebody else will believe. And maybe the other spouse will believe. Maybe the kids will believe. Maybe the kids get saved first. You know that happens sometimes. And sometimes that's what it takes to get mom and dad saved. One reason why we insist on having children's ministry is because sometimes parents have no interest in church of God at all. But for some reason, they want their son or their daughter to be in church. That's why she doesn't just babysit in the morning. She teaches them. She opens up the Word of God. She makes it dynamic and alive. Bring your kids. They've got something good for them. Amen? You got kids? Bring your kids. My kid's 35. Bring them anywhere. We just won't put them down there. Because that'd be weird. He'd feel awkward. So would the kids. So would my wife. God can restore. Once the sin problem's fixed, He can start fixing everything else. And it takes time. It does. Not the sin problem. That takes a moment. Amen? We don't work on getting saved. We let God save us. We seek God to be our salvation. Amen? That's a decision. That's a commitment. That's the change of a moment. But everything else in our life, God will work on. And He'll take time. And as we continue to trust in Him, live for Him, submit to Him, God can restore the years and fill the life with the same blessings as those that had never been hit by the locusts or the afflictions of life or of sin. You know he can do that? He can do that. So what about my marriage? I've been married four times before I came to Jesus. All right, well, why don't you forget about all those past marriages, amen? They're broken and gone in history anyway. Again, I, I know I, I preach a lot about this. I've preached a lot about this over the years. But, but it's something that needs to be heard and reinforced because even Christians can fall back into this old trap of living in the mistakes of the past and letting that bog us down, mire us down. And then we don't want to live for God anymore. We don't think we can live for God anymore. We don't think there's any grace left for us. We don't think there's, there's any chances. But God can fix it. He can wipe it all off the board. He can give a new start. He can start a new life in us. For those that will trust in Him. And He can make it worth it. He really can. He can make it so that what you've endured hasn't been for nothing. It isn't suffering without cause. It doesn't have to be just pointless suffering, meaningless suffering. It doesn't have to be like that at all. He can make it so that it's worth it. He can restore the richness and the joy and the peace so that no matter how old or young you might be, what you have, what time you have on the earth can be better than the whole past of your life. It really can be. Going back to that sister, hers was. Hers was. I think her name, I think her name was Lena. She went to conferences. Old and infirm, shaky as could be. She still went to conferences. Our church conferences. She flew. That was before mask mandates and all that other stuff. I think that's finally expired. I don't know how this whole thing with the World Health Organization panned out. I haven't looked into it. I've been kind of trying to ignore it so we can get the ceiling in there painted, the plumbing fixed, and other things that we need to work on. But I don't know. Maybe they'll try to push all that back into place. But God is still in control. Amen. He can restore the years, the richness, the joy. How? He speaks of provision and Plenty. I'm going to get my piano player up here in a moment. We're going to pray here shortly. Provision and plenty. He says in these same verses, if we go back and, 
and, and read through them again and, and pay attention to them. He says, Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for He hath given you the former, the former rain modestly, moderately, and He will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, the latter rain in the first month. These are, these are concepts that are very, very, very important to farmers, ranchers, and so on, okay? Just like most of these folks were. And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the vets shall overflow with wine and oil, and I will restore to you the years. He said the floors will be full of wheat. He said in verse 26, and ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. He speaks of provision and a satisfaction. God knows how to pour blessings into your life. Am I the only one that knows anything about this? I didn't know any of you know this. I know some of you have experienced this deeply. You've experienced this very, very personally from God. Something's happened in your life. Whether it was your fault or not, that's really not even what I'm focusing on. I'm not focusing on that, right? Sin is always our fault. But somebody else's sin is someone else's fault. And just because of the brokenness of all of it, it can bring hard times on our lives that we didn't ask for and that we didn't have coming to us. Admittedly, all right? I'm not blaming the victim today, okay? Unless there's blame there to be had. But it doesn't matter whose fault it is. It doesn't matter if it was locusts or canker worms or palmer worms or caterpillars or whatever it was. It doesn't matter if it was the loss of a loved one or if it was some sin that you brought upon yourself or, or some sickness that came and cleaned you out. The fault and the nature of it does not matter today. What matters is that God still has the ability to fix it all. He still does. He still does. And I've rejoiced. I've, I've, I've rejoiced for the sake of my dad, my father. I've rejoiced that, that, he, that, that, he's, that he's found a deeper commitment seemingly to, to the Lord our God in, in the last few months. That he has, he's clung to God like a life raft instead of stepping back and in bitterness of heart blaming God. Although I will tell you the first thing first thing he did after we laid mom to rest he went through that whole house of his and I think he picked like picked up almost every ashtray in that place took it out to the garage and lit him on fire because he knew where her cancer came from he knew where that came from but it's not about blame it's about hope he says, the floors shall be full of wheat. Put that in modern terms today. The Albertsons will be overflowing with stock on their shelves. That'd be nice to see again, wouldn't it? Every time it seems like we walk in there and pick up some sausage so we can have some breakfast. No sausage. No sausage. Where's all the bacon? empty racks all over the place in there. I'm not going to get into conspiracies. I'm just saying that it is what it is. God says, I'll fill it all up to overflowing. I'll fill your life. I'll fill your life. And I know this has been coming around a lot in the last week or so. But, but here it is again. Maybe, maybe we need the repetition. I don't know. I'll fill your life with purpose meaning. And you don't know how desperate people are today for that. Because they've had so much nihilism and atheism and just worldly garbage and bad philosophy and even worse religion packed down their throats for decades now. Decades now. They've been told that they're a cosmic accident. That they have no value. That they have no meaning. And they've been told everything but the truth. That they are made in the image of God. And that God had a plan for them. Still has a plan for them. And that there's still hope for them. I still hope to have a life that actually means something. That it's not just going to be wasted away, devoured by everyone else's locusts and canker worms, devoured by circumstances and hardships and tragedies until you're left alone at Whispering Chase or up at Primrose sitting in a room waiting to die. There's hope. There's purpose. There's always been a purpose for everyone in this house today. 
And there's still hope in realizing that. God said the floor shall be full of wheat. The vat shall overflow with wine and oil. You shall eat in plenty. You'll be satisfied. Yes, he was talking about literal food here, but he speaks to us about meaning and purpose and richness and holiness of life that we can realize Christ in us and new life in him. He speaks of all these things. He knows how to pour blessings into your life. See, he says, if I won't open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing you cannot contain. We're going to bring this to a close right now with this. Uh, we bow our heads and close our eyes now in reverence to God. What's the message? Take heart. Be neither afraid or, nor dismayed. No matter your past or how much of it, God can restore the years if you'll trust Him and if you'll walk faithful to Him and in obedience to Him. If you'll have a hunger for Him and for His Word and for His Spirit. If you want God in your life, that's what it boils down to. God can restore the years. What losses have you suffered? They're real, I know. They're not fake. And they're not light. They're not small. Over the years, from, from time and chance, or in days gone by, or maybe even in the present day, from sins or from things gone wrong, but what losses have you suffered? You don't have to despair over it. There's still hope. And it's more than just hope. God is still the great restorer of souls and lives today. He's a restorer of marriages. He's a restorer of families. He's a restorer of friendships. He's a restorer of these things where we let the Spirit of God move in our life and, and, and lead us and guide us. God can make up for those losses if we will trust Him and walk in faith and uprightness before Him. How about it today? The choice is always ours. Live in the bitterness of crops devouring the ground or look to God in hope and watch Him move His hand in your life and start setting things right again. Restoring, filling with hope and blessing and righteousness and peace. Again, brothers and sisters, visitors, all these altars are open. Let's come and let's find a place to pray right now. God bless you as our prayer. Let's come and find a place to pray.
have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind to me. love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the ninety-nine. I didn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away. Coming after me, oh, overwhelming, never failing, restless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the ninety-nine. I didn't earn it, I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-failing, restless love of God. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately and will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. And the floor shall be full of wheat and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil and I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm my great army which I sent among you, God will even turn back judgment that he sent on a person's life. If that person repents, or that person trusts, if that person turns their heart again to Almighty God, 
And even God, even the things which God allowed to bring them low, were fixed. They were restored. God doesn't just wreck a person and leave them that way. They turn their heart to Him. God will put it all back together again. Fix things, restore things, give life new meaning all over again. Set things on the right track. It's been good to be here this morning. Church tonight at 6.30. I think I got the message for this evening. I was working on it last night, actually. So come on back. Get a fresh blessing again. Come on now. Say, I got laundry to do. It's Sunday night. Your laundry ain't going anywhere. Do it this afternoon. Get it done, right? Then walk away from it at about 6 o'clock. Come join us for 6.30 service. Go back. I promise you it'll still be there waiting for you. It will not abandon you. 